My name's Tom Kenny. Um, today I'm going to introduce our work on simplifying urban data fusion with Big Sur. This is joint work in collaboration with um, Neil and Mitra that took place at UCL. So the first question we should ask ourselves is um, what, what was Big Sur? This was a project from last year where we um, created an urban data fusion platform that took um, photographs, uh, GIS, uh, cartography mapping data, and 3D meshes, here shown on the left, and created um, a clean architectural model from these data sources, here shown on the right. Um, this system was generally successful, however, there were some limitations that stopped it from being used in practice. Um, so, uh, to outline these limitations, uh, Big Sur requires large amounts of street level photography. So, this is um, classically we know this as um, Google Street View photos. And the problem with this data source is that it aren't always isn't always available. Often, it's not able to um, get it's not possible to get access to all sides of a building. It's not able to take good photos of all sides of a building. Or you're not able to get into, for example, the interior courtyards of large urban structures. Um, in addition, processing these images required specialized hardware. It required um, an NVIDIA graphics card with a lot of memories. And there was no guarantee that the features that this um, that um, we would detect with uh, this expensive hardware would line up exactly with the photogrammatic um, meshes that were reconstructed using different images in a different pipeline. We can see the complicated Big Sur pipeline here on the right, and what we want to do is to remove the um, image branch at the bottom of this um, diagram in order to simplify the technique. Finally, Big Sur was very slow. Um, it took up to 15 hours to process each block, and we um, wish to improve that in this system. Our simplified urban reconstruction pipeline takes only um, GIS data here in green and a 3D mesh, typically from a photogrammatic source. And the goal is to create a clean building mass that is simpler and faster than the existing Big Sur system. Typically, these GIS footprints come from mapping providers and the 3D meshes um, come from photogrammatic reconstruction or LiDAR reconstruction or many other sources, but they typically contain a lot of noise. Here we can see um, noise examples in the model and we can see um, that there are often holes and other problems with these meshes. So the goal is to have a robust system that can work with these two data sources. Briefly, we'll divert into geometry and discuss um, how we um, will reconstruct our masses. The straight skeleton takes a 2D polygon here in green and allows it to shrink away. If we trace out the edges of the shrinking polygon, um, we see a graph that is called the straight skeleton. If we allow the polygon to shrink and grow on different sides with different speeds, we have a structure called the mixed weighted straight skeleton. Um, to use these uh, to create 3D models, we can imagine a roof model as such. Our 2D polygon now lies on the floor and the speed of each edge is re um, represented with a um, 3D plane associated with that edge. Depending on the speed of the edge with which it moves towards the interior or the exterior, we have different angles on this plane. Now as the polygon shrinks, we imagine a rising plane from our footprint and we can see that as it rises up, it follows our um, planes in order to create a solid roof model that we can use for further modeling. Here we see our footprint in green and our profiles in blue and um, we're going to be able to use slices of our um, roof model, the straight skeletons, in order to um, get our footprint to follow our profiles as this sweet plane rises up. This is, ex this is uh, presented in um, our previous work on procedural extrusions and um, we should um, take a little bit of time now to discuss what, um, what we like about the procedural extrusion representation. And mainly this is that we give a structural understanding of the architectural domain. This decomposition into both a 2D um, footprint or plan and a set of profiles gives us a representation that architects and city planners understand and has proven very flexible over a large domain. Um, to briefly discuss existing work in this area, we can um, decompose existing systems into two major categories. One is polyhedral mesh modeling, and this is where we're trying to fit polygons or triangles 
to um, our data source and the other is primitive mesh modeling and here we're trying to fit more advanced primitives so for example cubes or pre-built um, roof uh, sub-assemblies to our existing data. These different systems have a variety of different um, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Polyhedral mesh modeling is very easy to fit to um, a variety of real world data, but it has the um, issue that it ignores any urban price. Even though we know that we're modeling an urban area, polyhedral mesh modeling is often unable to use this data. Primitive mesh modeling is able to give a guaranteed worst case appearance. Once we fitted our roof to our models, we're fairly sure that it will still look like a roof. This um, fitting gives us semantic understanding, we know where our roofs are. However, it can only work with limited known primitives. If we only have a set of three roofs, our output will only um, contain these three roofs in different orders. Procedural extrusions somehow sit between these two extremes. Um, they're easy to fit to real world data. They have some sort of guaranteed worst case appearance, given what we know about the profiles. And they're also edit friendly, meaning we can go in and edit the plans and the profiles. And they're also watertight. Um, the resulting mesh uh, doesn't contain any holes or um, other discontinuities. There's a large amount of work in the corpus about mesh modeling and primitive modeling. I would encourage the um, viewer to go and look at these review papers listed in the bottom right. OK, so let us introduce now our urban um, data fusion platform called Cord Atlas. We can see here um, GIS um, footprints on the ground. And as we rotate the camera around, we can um, right click and select a block to import the photogrammetric meshes. Here we see one particular mesh in pink. And um, again, we can see the result of viewing this from different angles and moving our light probe around. However, what we're interested in is procedural extrusions. And here we've created a building mass. And we can see that by editing the plan and the profile of this building mass, we can try to match the um, geometry that we can see. But we can see that while this is an intuitive process, it can be a little bit fiddly and it can be very time consuming to model large um, geometric areas accurately. So what we would like to do is for this manual modeling to happen um, automatically. Let us now see how we do that. Um, we start off with our GIS uh, footprints here in green and our photogrammatic mesh in pink. This might contain a lot of noise and, and problems. We slice this mesh horizontally to create a large number of horizontal lines. We'll discard the um, GIS data in a second and we um, orient these lines to match the GIS data. There goes the GIS information. We next cluster these um, horizontal lines using their prominent directions, starting from the longest lines um, that we've discovered. We continue to cluster until we found all the prominent directions, and then we discard any clusters with an area below a certain threshold. We take our longest lines and project them onto the ground plane, and these have become our sweep edges, which will be important later on. Along these sweep edges, we slice our 3D mesh vertically to create a large number of noisy profiles. And then we process these profiles to create a nice set of clean profiles that are ready to go into our um, optimization stage. At this point, we run an optimization on the inputs, but I referred the um, viewer to the um, accompanying paper for the full details of this optimization procedure. The output of the optimization is a set of watertight footprints, and for each edge on these footprints, we have an assignment um, of a profile. These assignments will allow us to use the procedural extrusion system to create solid mass models. For every footprint, we get a separate mass model. Here we see um, examples in pink and purple. Let us see how this works on real world data. Again, we have our um, input. Um, noisy mesh here. We can compute the profiles and we can see a large number of profiles um, across the uh, footprint here. And we can see the um, sweep edges in the air and projected onto the ground plane. Optimizing these inputs will create our mass model output. which in this case gives us reasonable results. 
The advantage of using procedural extrusions as an editing tool becomes clear when we proceed to the next step, and we can go in and we can edit the plans and the profiles to tweak any errors that the optimization may have introduced. To summarize the uh, modifications we've made from Big Sur, our simplified approach only uses the sweep edges to compute the footprints. These are guided by the mesh heights and the um, sweep edge geometry in order to find our closed um, watertight footprints. We do not use any photographic information anymore, and um, the profiles are only used uh, and computed after we've identified the footprints in order to speed up the optimization process. At this point, we can um, look at some of the different parameters that have an effect before looking at the results. One of the advantages of our system is that we're able to keep the same um, footprints uh, layout, but to vary the quality of the profiles. This allows us to change the number of polygons in the model very easily and simply. We can see an input mesh on, on the left in pink, and in yellow, green and blue, we can see the effect of changing the um, quality of the profiles used. A second parameter that we investigate is the um, effect of the sweep edge area threshold. So if you remember, we had these um, clusters of horizontal lines that became sweep edges, and we discarded any clusters that were below a certain area. If we set this threshold very high, as in this um, yellow example, we can see that we lose out some of the detail, but we're able to create, again, a nice simplified representation of the geometry. Um, because this um, set of houses are on a hill, we see that the profile computation has not been good for this, uh, these uh, long stretches of building with this uh, coarse, uh, uh, with this high threshold um, in the area. However, as the threshold decreases uh, through the green and the blue examples, we can see that we have uh, much higher quality both profiles and number of polygons in the results. However, we can see that um, with a very low threshold, we begin to see some irregularities caused by the um, problems in the underlying data. Which uh, sweep edge area threshold to use is very much up to the user, and it depends on the kinds of artifacts that they're prepared to um, accept in the results. Now let's have a look at some real world results from three different cities. And again, we encourage the users to look at more results and details in the accompanying paper. First is New York. Um, this is a block from um, Lower Manhattan, and we can see the um, rectangular shapes of the buildings and the rectangular profiles are well represented by a parameterization. We can see that away from the edges of the building where we have good GIS guidance, there are some problems with um, rectification of the footprint, but otherwise the results are um, reasonable. Uh, we can look at some statistics for this result. We can see that there are 150 sweep edges. The optimization time was 445 seconds. The optimization contained about 20,000 variables, and the mean squared vertical error was 6 meters. The error, the linear error, um, that's the uh, non squared error, is shown on the right on this color plot. And we can see that for most areas of the roof, um, we have very good representation of um, the geometry. We can see that um, some areas in the interior, and for example, water towers aren't well um, captured because of this, this um, area parameter that was not set low enough to um, capture these features on purpose. The next example we look at is um, from Glasgow. You see the input again in pink and the output in blue on the right. The um, Glasgow problem contained 46 sweep edges, took only 11 seconds to optimize, had 3,000 variables and a mean squared error of 1.3 meters. Again, we can see a, a very good matching between the um, geometry and um, the mesh, as showed on the right of this um, plot. Um, the largest errors that we can see are between the individual um, houses, where, for example, chimneys and deep crevices between the buildings are not well represented. Finally, we can look at a result from Madrid. 
Here we have a very irregular shaped block with a large variety of different roof structures. And we can see that we're able to represent these, um, these structures in a meaningful uh, way, decomposing the building into footprints and profiles. The Madrid example had 28 sweep edges, took six seconds to optimize, again about 3,000 variables, and had a mean error of about, a mean squared error of about two meters. Looking at the linear error plot, we can see that the error was highest for some interior courtyards that the system was not able to find a configuration to match, but otherwise we managed to unfit the roof structures um, cleanly, with the exception of some interior gradients. As an aside, we can just to plot the profiles from these different cities. And I think this is quite fun that we're able to um, represent each city's character by a single plot showing the, um, uh, the profiles around an entire block of the city. And we can see that in New York, we mainly have um, rectilinear um, profiles um, starting from the street going straight up with no slope on the roof at all. In Glasgow, we have a very regular block with the same slope on every roof, traveling around the um, perimeter of the um, footprint. But in Madrid, we have a variety of different roof angles and roof heights, leading to much more interesting geometry. To discuss the limitations of the system, we can still we can say that um, our integer programming problems can still take up to 20 minutes to run. This is much faster than the many hours that Big Sur took to run. But um, for smaller blocks, we saw this is instantaneous, normally less than five seconds for um, smaller residential buildings. Um, another error with the system is when um, problems are encountered, when we do observe errors, they're at a semantic level. And this means that we can either be missing the entire substructure, as we saw in the New York example, we were missing the water towers, or we might have an entirely wrong gradient over an entire footprint, as we saw in the Madrid example. Um, and again, we have to say that procedural exclusions can only represent geometry that can be decomposed into our plans and profiles nicely. This means that curving structures that we might see in more modern architecture or um, overhanging structures um, might not be represented so well in the system. I'd like to thank the um, ERC and CAUS for providing funding for this project and to thank you for your attention. Um, thanks for the collaborators on the original Big Sur project, and I note that uh, software is available from this URL. Thank you.